<laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Olas. So, good afternoon. Oh, okay, so you're all awake. The lunch wasn't very good then, right? So, let me start with a question. How many of you here are fans of big data? Okay, so almost all of you. That's so sad, right? Because you will actually find this talk extremely disappointing, although Ulas uh, tried to uh, uh, tell you otherwise. Because what I will try to do in this talk is to go beyond the hype of big data. Okay? So you all know that this has, big data has now become the buzzword of choice, especially in the software industry. Okay? I even nowadays see our uh, Bangalore buses on the side there's an advertisement which says that big data is here, are you ready? <laughs> and if you know, because of all this uh, hoopla, you'll find that there are wild and magnificent claims that are being made saying that big data will solve all your problems, ranging from corruption to Bangalore traffic, both of which are well known to be NP hard problems, right? right? But we say that with big data, magically everything will work right. So, what I'll try to do in this talk is to try and inject a much needed dose of reality into the hoopla surrounding this new phenomenon and try and convince you that there is a lot more that needs to be done before big data can actually realize its potential. So please forgive me for that because I know that most of you would be wanting to write big data in the resumes. Maybe you'll change your mind after this talk. So first let's look at is big data really novel? That's what the software industry will tell you saying today we have tons of data and so on and you can do magnificent new insights because of this. But my claim is that this is actually very old wine in a terrible new bottle. Okay. Why? Here's the proof. There is a conference called VLDB, which is very well established in the database community. It's one of the three top conferences in the world. This started way back in 1975. Okay. So we have around 40 years plus of the conference already. And this stands for VLDB expands to very large databases. So I went and looked up the dictionary okay, and said, what are the synonyms of large? Large is approximately equal to big. Then very large is bigger than big. Then by definition, you guys are just dealing with big data. We have already solved very big databases. Okay, Big data is for children. Very big databases is for our database systems lab. Right? So, so that's the first point that this is an old problem actually, but propelled by a new dose of hype. The second point is that, although most people have tried to convince you otherwise, and everybody goes around saying, I have big data, I am Tarzan. That's actually not true. Most of the data you have is junk, because it comes from Twitter and other kinds of social media. Right? So there are only a, really, a few enterprises that have really big data. One is the CIA. Okay. And the other is Vijay Malia. You need to keep track of count. Everybody else just claims that because you feel this peer pressure saying, do you have big data? And if you say no, it means that you're not doing well. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, I also have big data, right? That's the thing. But there is very few people with really large databases that are curated. You can assimilate a large amount of junk, and that is usually happens. But if you want to look at refined curated data, then there are very few such institutions. In fact, the world's largest database, which is uh, uh, technically uh, appropriate to call a database is this World Data Center for Climate, notwithstanding Donald Trump, people do believe in climate change. This is located in Germany and this has only a very modest one petabyte of data. Okay. So much of the claims that you hear about big data are advertising claims. There is very little reality behind it. Okay. But certainly it looks good on the resume and all of you would like to say, yeah, I can do big data. Let me also point to you another very interesting article that came out in the op-ed page of the New York Times. This is uh, about four or five years ago. And then they said that uh, this was actually written by two faculty from the New York University. That's Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis. And what they said is, here are a large number of problems with big data. And the most important problem is that what you see written here, which is very important for us to introspect upon, is that Big data is prone to giving you scientific sounding answers to terrible questions. 
So the point is that big data encourages you to ask wrong questions because you'll always get an answer. And if you're doing deep learning, you'll get many answers, okay? One per layer of it and so on. But the starting point itself is wrong, okay? Here, they also give you an example of it, okay? There's a study done by some faculty at MIT and some research engineers from Google. And the question they asked is, everybody loves ranking today, including in institutions, right? They're not worth the paper that they're written on, but all of us love it, right? Saying IIC is number one in the NIRF, NIRF rankings. Okay, that's the one true rankings, but all the other rankings are bogus, right? So, the question, oh. so the question is, they wanted to say that, who are the most important historical figures in the world? How do we evaluate this? You start going and looking at all the web pages ever produced in the world and try to see the frequency of occurrences of these names. So that's the question, who's bigger, where historical figures really rank? Not surprisingly, number one goes to Jesus Christ. But after that, you see that Hitler ranks higher than Aristotle. Okay? So you can see that Aristotle will be rotating this grave at a fairly high frequency, given the fact that he has done the entire philosophical basis of the world, but you are giving Hitler a higher ranking than Aristotle, just because of the fact that there were more websites around after Hitler, Hitler came now. So you can see that, firstly, the wrong question is asked because you cannot rank these figures in the first place. You should not be ranking them. And that's true for education institutions also. You should not be ranking it. Education is not a sport. Okay? It's a lifetime of disappointment. So <laughs> why do you want to do this? So this is the wrong question. Because you have a deep learning machine, you'll always come out with answers and there'll be a list of 10 names that will come through. So we need to ensure that big data does not wind up becoming huge nonsense. Now, there's also a very interesting course, and I'm not making this up, okay? You can go and check it yourself. I was intrigued when I saw this. The name of the course is callingbullshit.org. This is an actual one credit course at the University of Washington at Seattle, a very well-known university in computer science. Those of you familiar with complexity theory we know that Richard Karp is also there. And this is a genuine course, okay? It's not something that's made up, although the name seems to suggest that, okay? And what they say is that earlier, when people were trying to con you, it was usually couched in big words and fancy rhetoric, demonetization. That's what you would see. But more and more we see it presented instead nowadays saying that the data told me so. I did one terabyte of data and here are the answers and I did a fancy algorithm using a linear algebra on it. I inverted this huge matrices and so on. I took the Lagrangian somewhere and somehow something came out of the other end. Okay? And these quantitative, statistical and computational forms of bullshit are those that will be covered in the course. I would highly recommend you to go and look at it. There are several case studies which show you how A, you get the wrong question and B, you get the wrong answer. That is because you don't understand the domain. And it's very important that like the physics people, we first understand domain and then try to come up with theories. Any big data or deep learning thing, if they see many apples falling, what will they say? Apples keep falling all over the world. They don't discover gravity, right? So if you want to have genuine use of big data, the data should always come second or even third to your own mind and country. It should not be the substitute for thinking. We in India love to do outsourcing. Everything is outsourced, right? Including thinking, right? The important thing is that big data should only be uh, something that adds to your own intuition about the problem, but should not become a substitute for it. Because right now, as you know, given large amounts of data, you feed it into any kinds of machine learning technique, something will come out with the other end. Okay? Hitler will come out many times, and then Aristotle, poor guy, will be in the third layer of the perceptron hanging around trying to make his way through it. Right. So the very important point is not to be swayed by big data, because then it means you don't understand the domain. First, the engineering should come, and then you should do the data analysis. Okay, so what has happened in the current research community? Currently, most of the focus is on how do you provide the, what I like to call is the plumbing infrastructure for these environments. That is, you're trying to come up with new programming models. All of you are familiar and maybe some of you are even experts in MapReduce and so on. Then you also know that there are these nice V factors associated with big data, okay? V with velocity, V with volume and so on. So once you have a large amount of data coming at a very high pace, then you have data streams. You need to be able to process this data. 
and you need to be able to approximate it and summarize it in some fashion because you cannot handle the entire window at, at one shot. You also need to come up with approximation algorithms. So this is where the computer science people start uh, uh, mouth-watering that saying, okay, now I can come up with new techniques by which I can come up with various kinds of probabilistic or deterministic guarantees on the uh, 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 objectives of these particular algorithms. And then you have storage architectures, which say that how do I store either the entire data or whatever is the operational window that you can currently hold it in your system. Huh. And then here is something that is a advertising person's delight. Two buzzwords coming together. Okay, big data and cloud hosting saying send it to the cloud. Okay, everything magically work. It doesn't, right? It's like the foot bridges in Mumbai, right? They keep falling all the time. So you have cloud hosting, and then we all love analytics. Right? We don't know why they're coming out and say this is good, because it also comes with the quantitative numbers. Managers love quantitative numbers, saying 95% of the people like Sensodyne over close up or something like that, right? This looks good because then it, because the moment you mention numbers, even though they're wrong and they're invariably wrong, it looks authentic that you know what you're saying. You tag on a number to a qualitative thing, it looks authentic. And nobody is willing to question it after. So, and then last one is security. You can never have too much of security. Otherwise, you're anti national straight away, right? By definition, they'll put you in JNU if you do this, right? So you bring security together, you put cloud and you put big data. Okay? It's an advertising dream come true. But let me let you in on a secret. None, okay? none of these techniques will ever work in practice. Guaranteed. Okay? I've not written that here, but let me give you my personal guarantee. None of these systems will ever work for you. Why? Because there is an elephant in the room, which nobody's talking about, and that is how do you test such deployment? in the first place. You can build it, like Kevin Costner said in the famous movie Field of Dreams, but how do you know it will work? Okay. So you might say that, okay, I think we are all programmers here. We are in India is a superpower in the information processing. Okay, Only we say that. Nobody else in the world says that. right? We are all done this uh, lots of the three or four years of programming here. But look at what some of the more respectable people in the world have said. And these are all actually fairly old quotes. 50% of the cost in Microsoft is on testing. Okay. And then if you look at SAP, which produces all these enterprise resource management uh, products, which are very popular, it takes up six, one third of their entire product release cycle. And then this is a very old quote. Okay. About 15 years back, you find that the damage is around $60 billion. Of course, now Trump is doing that single-handedly, so it doesn't matter. But due to software bugs, okay, $60 billion. But you might say, okay, that was 15 years back. We you guys only were born in this century and so on. Everything is working well today. We have Accenture, Cognizant, Infosys. We are all joining that. Right? So let me show you a very uh, a few recent big data disasters. So let's start with the United Kingdom. This is in 2013. Okay. So as you, many of you, those of you are familiar with British history, would remember that they get into this periodic bouts of xenophobic nationalism, where they say that. Let's kick out anybody who is not white and Anglo-Saxon. Okay. Let's get all the Sadajis back into Punjab and send them out. Okay. And so they sent a home office message saying, get rid of illegal immigrants. Okay. And what they found is that many people were contacted in error. I'm surprised they didn't even send it to the Queen of England saying, I think you're an illegal immigrant. Because people who had lived there for centuries were suddenly told that you are an illegal immigrant. Please get out of the country uh, sooner than later. So almost 40,000 people were sent incorrectly. So then the government said, ah, I know the problem. That's because it's a government agency that has done this. And the mantra is privatize it. If you privatize it, things will work wonderfully well. And that's why the commission capita, which is a very well-known outsourcing firm, saying, you guys take over this problem. But as we know, especially very well in India, is the only place worse than the government is the private industry. Okay? They make it into an art form and they charge you for it. Okay, it's like an MBA, expensive common sense. Right? Look after your customers. Yeah, sure. I mean, right? It's, but they'll charge you for it. Right? Okay, so let's say what Capita did. It was accused of making the problem even worse. Okay, it was supposed to be replacing these fuddy daddy bureaucrats, those of the, of the type that you would have seen in the Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister series. But then they said they made it even worse. And then they had a backlog of 150,000 notifications, especially to foreign students. Okay, and they still couldn't figure out whether they should or shouldn't be in the country. 
and if you look at it in IT terms, it's a billion dollar project saying I have e-borders. Sounds good, right? Everything is electronic and so on. Great. Routinely missing deadlines and delivery dates. And what is probably the funniest thing is actually a little sad is that it may not even be legal under the then existing EU legislation. Now you know the real reason for the Brexit. They can't handle the software. It's not because of nationalism or anything like that. Because the software doesn't work, let's get out of the European Union before other people discover how badly we've been programming in Java. That's the reason for Brexit. You know? Okay, you might say, well, England is a third world country anyways. They've stolen most of the stuff from here. It serves them right. So let's come to the US instead, which many of you would be wanting to go to in your dreams, right? So let's look at Obama. He unveiled his healthcare.gov portal, which is the health insurance portal. This was on October 1st, 2013 supposed to be the flagship program for the president, something which he has staked his reputation on. Day one, day one, okay, severe problems were caused by extremely high volumes when they got 250,000 users, when they had only expected that there would be around 50,000 or so. So I might say, well, you must give the guys a break, it's on day one, they thought it was 50, it turned out to be 250 and so on. But when you look into the details, you'll see that it's actually uh, scandalously shocking. They said it was not just an issue of volume. It also involved software and systems design issues. That is how you build the whole architecture. And this is actually true, although I still find it hard to believe. The stress tests were done by the private contractors one day before the unveiling of this. Even Indians would have been proud of this. Suresh Kalmadi would say, this is me, okay? One day, this is the Jugaad system, completely. One day before the launch date. And then they found that the site became slow with more than a thousand users. They said we are expecting 50,000, it became 250,000 and so on. They couldn't have handled more than a thousand customers well. And you can see that the testing has been less left to the very end. Okay, you might say, but don't be so picky. After a few weeks, everything will be fine. The problems persisted several weeks after the launch. So this is the most powerful person in the world. You can bomb Afghanistan, you can bomb Iraq, but you can't get a web server running. Okay, that's what you see here. There are limits even to presidential power. So what happened is that they had a networking error at the, the data services hub. It killed the website functionality completely. And what is again particularly sad is that Kathleen Sebelius, who was then the uh, Health and Human Services Secretary, just the previous day had said, this network hub is a symbol of a government success. So she was actually forced to resign a few weeks after this, precisely because of the networking hub. Okay. So those of you who are going to work in networking, please make sure it works at least when the VIPs press the button. Okay, then you might say, fine, these are all anyway countries which don't have good programming power. India is an IT superpower, right? You're all proof of the living proof of that. Let's look at what happened with our flip card to flop card in 2014. Many of you may have been part of it. Many of you may have contributed to it by trying to get these good uh, uh, say, uh, 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 deals, right? Big apology day follows the big billion day. Okay. Look at the issues. You had hordes of angry customers who couldn't get the discounts they were promised, couldn't get the supplies, couldn't get the products that they were, that were being advertised and so on. And then you see what the Bunsel said. They said that we were not adequately prepared for the sheer scale of the event. Now, again, they could be forgiven if it was something that they had thought over a week and said, okay, let's do a quick and dirty job and go with it. But look at what they also say. It took enormous effort from everyone at Flipkart. Many of them are seniors. Many months of preparation. So this is not something that was done in a hurry. They had thought through this very carefully. A lot of design has gone into it and pushing the capabilities and systems to the limit for the big day. So this was a, certainly a big ticket item for them, one of their flagship programs, and they had put the entire company behind it. But they made an absolute mess of it. Okay? You'll see that there are all kinds of things, price changes, out of stock, cancellations, website issues. Nearly 5,000 servers are deployed. They're prepared for 20 times the traffic growth, but the volume of traffic was much higher than this. So you can see that with all the best of planning and having extremely good engineers and so on, you will wind up with a lot of mud on your face, right? Another case of big data, right? Look at all the elections, exit polling, 
CNN, IBM roles. Then they have the, uh, all the various kinds of uh, 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 the different uh, polling agencies picking up uh, uh, data from all the uh, uh, people who are coming out from the polls or even prior to it and subsequent to it and so on. What is remarkable is that how badly they get it wrong. Look at the Tamil Nadu polls in 2011. Okay? Everybody said it's too close to call between Karnanidhi and Jailalitha at that time, God rest her soul, very close to each other. And they said it's little more for DMK, 120 seats, whereas it's probably around 110. This will be a hung assembly and so on. Jailalitha had not read any of these reports. It was a landslide victory. She just steamrolled out the opposition, 200 plus. Okay, you might say that, well, this is happens often in South India, they get affected by movie stars and so on. But look at the Delhi Assembly elections in 2015. Only 70 seats. Both the pre-polls and the post-polls have said it's a toss-up race, there's a slight edge that the BJP may have or the AAP party and so on. These are the challengers, these are the people who will stay here and so on. And everybody was making across the entire set of polls. But then again, Kejriwal, being a good IITian, had not read any of these reports. You saw that it was worse than a landslide. They just massacred the opposition. In fact, I think even the three that they gave was because they wanted somebody to contradict them assembly. It's very boring to talk to your friends, right? You want somebody to say no, and then you squash the guy. 67 and 3. So you can see these are not small errors that you're making. It's not a percentage error. These are orders of magnitude errors that you're making. And this is something as simple as you're just asking a Boolean question. Who did you vote for? That's it. There's nothing complex about it. There are no uh, 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 complicated decision issues to be made. You don't require deep learning for this. Not even one layer. Just say, who did you vote for? Single question mark, right? But you get it spectacularly, uh, spectacularly wrong. US presidential elections. Even Trump thought that Hillary will win. Okay? He was the guy more shocked with all of this. Right? This, this. You saw this. Similarly, you saw in Uttar Pradesh recently with Yogi Adityanath, same issue was there. Everybody said it's going to be a hung assembly and so on, and there'll be all kinds of horse trading subsequently. And then they realize it's only going to be cow trading. There's no horse trading required because they have won the elections, right? So you can see that in all of these issues, the problem is that you are doing it incorrectly. All the polling that they do is mostly done because people are lazy to go and talk to the right people in a sense. You are supposed to get a nice random sample. That is what you would have heard in this entire one week of the course, right? Probability, statistics, and so on, and rational agents. So, but who would want to go to the villages and go and count those things? You just walk down the street here, ask your friends, and say, that's the answer that you have. Okay? Most big data is like that. Either it's wrong or it's horribly wrong. There are only two choices here. It is never correct. Okay, okay so now this motivates us to watch what we are trying to do here is that how do you do to testing of complex software systems. And the difficulty here is the mindset. Most of you would have this inherent bias that I am a code writer. Okay? I had directly device drivers on Linux. Some other bozo is going to be doing the testing of this. This is the typical kind of atmosphere that you find in the software industry. Emphasis is on I am developing a cool new model. I don't want to look at what is currently there. And we find that routinely with our own students, they don't want to see the previous person's code saying, I write it from scratch myself. I don't like my senior's code. I can't even understand a word of it. Neither could the senior, but anyway, that was the thing. So what is the solution? You have to automate this process because this is something that people don't like to naturally do. Computers are cheap, and more importantly, they don't complain unlike pampered software engineers, right? OK. So how do you do this? Now we say that automate, uh, this testing is a database problem. Like all good problems, testing is also a database problem because you have a variety of optimizations in different flavors. It's all about logical independence from the data to the evaluation of the testing platform. And it has not yet been solved. So it means that our salaries are still going to be intact for a while. Now, I would agree with you when you say that, especially those of you looking for jobs next year would say that the last thing that I would like to do is to be a tester because that is supposed to be the hell to which all bad software engineers are put in. I agree that doing testing itself is extremely boring. It's almost as bad as watching Rahul Dravid bat. Okay? But if you are designing research testing methodology, that is how to do testing, that is extremely interesting and challenging. Okay? Because there are a lot of nice intellectual problems which have immediate practical impact because the testing is being done for a particular purpose in the industry, covers the entire spectrum from computer science theory 
to algorithms, data structures, experiments, prototypes, and so on. Okay? So if you are designing the testing methodology as opposed to doing the testing itself, that's much more interesting and challenging. And if you are in, uh, interested in this area, you can go and look up this special issue of the IEEE Data Engineering Bulletin. Uh, uh, this is in uh, 2008, which focuses solely on how do you do testing and tuning of database systems. Because most database engines today come with about 100 different parameters. And if you have 100 different parameters, nobody knows how to set them. Even if you assume, for simplicity, that all the parameters are Boolean, that is just yes or no or zero or one, you immediately have a space of two to the power of 100 values. And nobody knows how to set them. It's like the Indian scooter, right? You, whenever a scooter doesn't start, what do you do? You bend the scooter, it magically starts. We don't know why, right? But because we are praying to 33 crore gods, something should be happening, right? So in the same way, what you see here is that nobody knows how to set them right, except a few experts. And they are very highly paid. So these are the database administrators, where they come in and give you the special numbers and say, put 25 here, put 60 here, put 80 there, and so on. And somehow things work. So it's very important to be able to come up with automated techniques by which you can make this sure that the systems are, operate, are operating at their optimal uh, 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 location. So let's start with a very fundamental question. How do you even know that the answer to your question was correct? Okay, you go to the database system and say, oh, great database system. Here is my SQL query. You'll say, ha, huh, OK, maybe I think I'll answer it. It gives you back an answer. How do you know it's right? One is that you might say, I went to Tirupati, ate a few laddus and came back, and therefore it should be right. Okay. But actually, checking is very hard because the data is very large. If the data was small, you could go and manually check it yourself. Like you see in India, right? The shopkeepers will have a calculator. He'll do it on the calculator. Then he'll go and write it again by hand on the paper and then check it again, which means that why did you require the calculator in the first place, right? But uh, logic has never been the strong point in India. So here also, this checking is very hard because of the magnitude of data. How do you know? Yeah. Uh, same uh, uh, query then on the two databases and check whether those are uh, two are giving the same results or not. Yeah, they'll give the same wrong result. <laughs> that is the problem, right? It's machine learning. So, because you're using similar algorithms, and I'll show you an example of this, so just to make this clear. But you have a huge amount of data. You cannot go and manually check and see whether this is right or not. And the queries are very complex. Okay? They have a large amount of information that's being integrated in many different ways. So how do you even figure out what is going on here? And in fact, this was studied. In fact, this is, uh, study is actually about two decades old, but even then it was true. And I'll show you an example of this. Let's just look at when you do the translation, not from the SQL to the database engine, but from the initial point where, let's say, your vice chancellor says, I want to ask a particular query on the database. Let's say how you, you make mistakes in translating from the expectation the user had to the equivalent SQL that you think you're producing. So here is a title of a column in a newspaper, public demands change. What is your interpretation of this? Or what possible interpretations could you put to this? Yeah? Correct. So one is that the public is demanding change, saying that I don't want any of this uh, 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 kind of uh, old traditional uh, values. I don't want moral, moral policing. Many of you would be I don't want moral policing. This is all, all fuddy duddy stuff. What's another interpretation? Okay, this the last one. What is the second one that you would have? So, so if you're a sociologist, you would say that I'm monitoring how things are happening and the nature of public demands are changing. That 20 years back, they were asking for dal, roti, chawal, and so on. Today, they're asking for internet bandwidth, right? That is the difference that has occurred. Other things are optional, right? But actually, what it was, so that's the first two. One is that the public is demanding change in society, or that the nature of public demands themselves are changing. Okay? But it was actually what somebody here mentioned, and for this, I think you deserve two chocolates, if not one, right? Okay, was that here? Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, I was supposed to throw this out here. Okay? So the public is demanding loose change. They just needed coins for the bus. Okay? Of course, you software engineers won't realize this. You'll go on your own air conditioned Mercedes and so on. But for people like us going in the bus, there would be an issue here. And so what is more interesting is that only 40% of the queries that you write are correct. And even after we tell you it's wrong, 
by which time your antenna should have gone up. More than 80% are written correctly only after two to three attempts. So it's not that you get it right the second time because you are careless the first time. Even after looking at it many times, you find that you still make mistakes. So let's look at what kind of errors can happen. One is the syntactic errors. This is easily solved. Okay, All the programming languages types have already solved this for us. You have an automatic parser generator. Indians are traditionally known to be extremely poor at spelling and punctuation. This will fix it. If you forget a semicolon, you will know what to do with it. If you forget how to spell select, it will catch that and so on. So this is easy to do. Okay, syntactic errors. Semantic errors could be in terms of, for example, that you are trying to do uh, uh, a comparison between two objects of different data types. That you are, let's say, trying to compare a string with a floating point number, for example. These kinds of type errors are easy to check from the metadata in the database system, which is the database catalogs, which keeps track of all the different column types and so on. You will say that, oh, you're trying to do a string match with a floating point value. I, I will inform the CIA immediately and terminate you with extreme prejudice because you have committed this grave sin. Okay? So this can be easily caught. Arithmetic errors like dividing by zero, bank balance of ISC faculty and so on, easy to check at runtime, okay, not a problem. This can be easily done by the hardware or you have the checks that you can put. But there are many more semantic errors which are very hard to catch and I'll just show you one example of that. So this is that you not know that in database systems, whatever you give, the database system doesn't trust you that you know how to write things properly. It says, I know better than you. It's like your parents, we know better. So it takes the query and rewrites it in a hopefully equivalent form, which is much more efficient to execute. But it's possible that you make errors in this rewriting. And this is what is called as the infamous count bug. This was discovered in 1986, and I'll show that to you in the next slide. Or there could be mistakes in your implementation of the uh, uh, various operators in the database system. For example, a hash join. It's not easy to get the coding right. You may put in a few infinite loops there, or mistakes, and so on. So this could go wrong. You may have mistakes in the indices, especially with regard to boundary conditions. And then, uh, so uh, in fact, I had a recent example of that with the State Bank of India here. If you uh, uh, close a fixed deposit or a term deposit prematurely, they are supposed to charge you some penalty on the interest that was coming from that fixed deposit, right? On the interest part. So suppose you had a 9% interest or whatever on the fixed deposit that you had started in the bank. You are supposed to, because of premature closing of this fixed deposit, you are supposed to be charged a penalty on the interest part of it. I got the shock of my life when I got the penalty to be put on the principal amount. Okay, half the fixed deposit had vanished. Then I went there and said, look what's happening. This was supposed to be X amount and now it is 0.5X and I thought you're only going to do this on interest. And they said, yeah, you're right. This is a software error because of our IT system. Okay, they went back and checked and found that the software by mistake because it was a boundary condition had gone and removed, put the penalty on the principal amount and not on the interest. Okay? So and if it can happen to SBI, it can happen to anybody, right? Punjab National Bank guaranteed, it's the feature, right? You want to do it. Right? There are also transaction management errors. You all know this asset properties, you are supposed to give them to you the solid guarantees on stamp paper, we'll write ACID and so on. But even something called ARIES, which is the traditionally nowadays the de facto standard in all database engines, it has errors during the checkpointing process. Very subtle and rare errors, but they do occur. So let me just show you an example of that here. So I, I assume that all of you are SQL compliant, okay? At least because you still have to take the gate exam next year. Okay? So if you want to list all the departments that have an equal number of faculty and students, so this is a vice chancellor kind of question saying I want to look at departments which have a one is to one faculty to student ratio. Let's assume that this is the schema of the relational database that you have. There is a department table with the department name and the number of faculty. Okay? So quite simple. And then you have a table which lists all the students. This is the student's roll number, student's name, and which department he or she is part of. And you want to ask the question is that which departments have a one is to one faculty to student ratio? So you would probably write an SQL query like this, which is a nested SQL query, where you're picking out all the department names, where the number of faculty in that department is equal to the count of the students in that particular department. Okay. If you can't pass it in real time, don't worry. This is the correct query. And this is actually in the, in the database jargon known as a correlated query because you have an external variable okay, of the department which is also showing up here. So typically what database systems will do is that if you give a query like this, they will break it into pieces. Okay? So they will essentially do what is called as decorrelation because it is more efficient to implement subsequently. 
So for example, here what you would notice is for each department, so suppose there are 60 departments, you have to go through the entire student table. 60 scans of, and you are all big data people, so let's say there is 120 billion people in this. Okay? So all the real people in India plus Benami accounts is 120 billion. That's the number that you would have. Right? So if you put all of this together, you have to do many scans for this database, or this table, which would make it very slow. So what do you say? I'll decorrelate this particular query. What do I do? I first create a temporary relation. I go through the student table and I do a single scan over the student table, where for each of the departments, I count the number of students that are there. Okay. So with a single scan of the table, I produce all this information. Subsequently, I now do this join between the department and this temporary table, where I look for the department name matching this department name here, and whether the number of faculty is equal to the number of students. So you see that both these tables now, student and department, are looked at only once. Here, you would have looked at the student table as many times as there are departments. Okay? So this is an iterative for loop, whereas here, all that you're doing is to do two scans. Much more efficient on the surface. But let's look at what happens in reality. On the surface, this looks an excellent approach. Right? Let's say that you had only two departments. Okay? Anyway, the others, others don't count here. Right? So you have the CSA department which you are part of here and the Department of Computational and Data Sciences, which is next door. Let's say I'm the last faculty remaining here. Okay? And CSA has closed shop because all the faculty have run away to Google and Amazon. Right? This is the usual thing that you see nowadays. So it's an empty building, okay? but you need to keep it running. Here are the students. There's only one student, which is Rajni Kant, is the student in CDS. Now, if you took the output of the nested query that I showed you earlier, you would have two departments coming out, both CDS and CSA, because CDS has one student and one faculty, and similarly, CSA has zero faculty and zero students. That's also matching. But if you did the decorrelated query, that is a two-stage process, then you get only this answer. So you see that there is an error now that is creeping in because of the boundary conditions where you did not think about the fact that there might be departments with zero faculty. Okay, so this was known as the infamous count book, and there are many such errors that you can do in the rewriting process. So what do database engines do? So all these things like Postgres or DB2 from IBM or SQL Server from Microsoft or Oracle, where many of you would have used pirated versions of Oracle, right? Right, right, oh, okay. So we won't go into that. So let's SQL test libraries they have. They have a set of fixed queries for which you already know what the answer should be. These were designed by the engine developers themselves or certain domain specialists. And then you run the regression test on this workload. Okay? So you have a set of test files, run it across it. If it works, fine, that's the right uh, system. Otherwise, you go and check what has happened. But the problem is that this has very limited coverage because it will only check whatever you had in these files. It does not check anything outside of it. So then you might say, oh, I've taken the prop stats course in this summer school of uh, CSA. I am an expert now on martingales and whatever that means. Okay? So I will do stochastic and random generation of SQL queries, where I'll put arbitrary selects from the group bys and so on in some major chow chow of things. I'll put it all together and send it on the system, and I'll check the answer. And in fact, this has been tried by Microsoft. It's called the RAG systems, random generation of statements. First problem is that it could be extremely expensive, because you might wind up joining the entire, all the set of tables in the database. Okay? So it may take you years to find out your system is not working. It's like the those of you who have uh, uh, looked at the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, okay? the question there is that what is the meaning of life? And after it computes for a very large amount of time, it says 42. And you say, what does 42 mean? It says, now let me start computing again. Right? So here also is that extremely expensive on real databases. You cannot do this in real time. And what is worse is that even if you had patience and said, my great grandchildren will come and pick up the answer for this. I'm waiting for it. They have Aadhaar cards. They will do it. Right? Unlikely to catch still the boundary value errors because these are rare stochastic events and you will not get it from this. It will also not catch specific kinds of situations, something called a self-join where you join a table with itself. Okay? So an incestuous relationship like this will not be caught by a typical uh, 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 stochastic approach. And what is worse is that when you have such a large number of random variables, they'll invariably be correlated because you are generating them from the computing system. They're not genuine random variables. They have correlations, when, especially when they're a larger number. OK, so because of all this, even the current database systems are in terrible shape. Okay, Don't quote me outside. Our funding depends on them. But it is in a very bad shape. If you go to big data, 
the mind only boggles at what could happen. Now you have an infrastructure which is a hybrid of many components. There is an ETL logic that is the data cleaning part. There's information retrieval, knowledge management. Okay, looks very nice. And then the database system which does the heavy lifting of the uh, 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 query processing and uh, data processing. So, so one example is, for example, in Infosphere from IBM, which has a data stage, quality stage, master data management, DB2, which is the real database engine, big insights, that's the analytics engine, right? Metadata repository and so on. And you need to test all these components for A, functionality, that is what are the programs doing, do they operate on all the right kinds of data and so on. And then you, you can also have to look at, does it handle all the kinds of SQL queries correctly? And in the IR world or in the machine learning world, is it producing the right kinds of models that you're having? Because the whole idea of learning is that you come up with st summary statistical models for large amounts of raw data. And then when you actually execute this, are you getting the right kinds of output from these systems? So just to put this in perspective, your goal is that you want to test what is called as a Yottobyte system, which is this mythical 10 to the power of 24 byte system on the Infosphere. So this is what Gini Rometty, who is the CEO of, uh, uh, of IBM, says go and do this. And I want you to test for functionality, correctness, performance, and scalability. And so, this is completely impractical, both in terms of time, because how do you process 10 to the power of 24 data, or even store it in the first place. So the time-space trade-off does not exist. You cannot even do this in the first place, right? Because by that time, anyway, IBM would have been bought over by somebody else. Infosys would have bought it, right? So let's start from scratch. So ideally, what we'd like to have is a complete testing environment for big data management systems. And the key here is that the only way to test big data systems is by not having data. It sounds paradoxical, but the moment you let data in, just like the camel entering the tent, that's the end of the story. The best way to test big data is without data. That is where the entire data and metadata is virtual or transient. Either it doesn't exist or it's just passing by. It never stays there at rest. Because then you can have efficient evaluation of this deployment scenario. Okay, so our goal was to build this metadata construction tool that would fill, uh, fool the underlying system to thinking that you have all this huge amounts of data when it actually not even a single byte or a bit is actually there. So we developed a tool called COD, that's C-O-D-D, -D, which stands for constructing data-less databases. Okay. You can see we have turned the whole thing on its head. And those of you familiar with database systems will know that this is also happens to be the name of Ted COD, who was the father of relational database systems, also Turing Award and so on. And Interestingly enough, in archaic language, the word cord means an empty shell. And that's exactly what we are. Nothing real about it, like the Pepsi ad, right? There's nothing real about this, nothing official about it. It's just a box with nothing inside it. But that's the only way you can test this system. So this is a graphical tool, which allows you to do automated production and maintenance of all kinds of database metadata configurations. Entirely written in Java, about 50,000 lines of code is what I'm told by the students, some of whom are also here. Okay, you can check it with them. Every year I ask them, they say, add another 10K. I think we did something like that, right? So over five years, it has come up to 50K now. Okay. It's operational on all the well-known uh, database uh, vendors, uh, ranging from DB2 to PostgreSQL. It's completely free software. Many students in Madhya Pradesh submit this as their VTech project, okay? But we don't mind because we do get uh, 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 a free visibility from that. It's completely free, including the documentation, the software, everything else. And it's already in use in several industrial and academic research labs in various parts of the country and outside. So we were able to successfully simulate this Yottobyte target that we had, which is 10 to the power of 24 bytes, on a simple laptop. Why? Because everything is fake. Once you don't have the data, you can do it even on your phone itself, right? But you might say, okay, did you really find anything with it? And we actually did. We were able to find a deep bug in a very well-known popular commercial database system whose first letter is one of the vowels in the English alphabet. I didn't tell you the name, okay? So it's the commercial database system, and this only surfaces at big data scale. Specifically, it surfaces at 10 to the power of 20 bytes. Now, that is not because of Vastu reasons. The reason that it happens is that about 15 years back, one of the programmers said that the largest value that I can ever think of is something of the order of 10 to the power of 20 bytes. Because in uh, 2000, you would say that you know, the world would have ended. Because the world was supposed to end, you remember, in 2012, okay, the Spaniards. 
because who will ever reach that? It's a humongous value which is equal to infinity. So they put that in the code saying 10 to the power of 20 is the maximum limit. And this was a hidden value which nobody knew about because they said we'll never reach this. So the replacement, the numerical replacement for infinity was 10 to the power of 20 bytes. But today we have reached this and notice that whenever you had done the testing, it would have been up to 10 to the power of 19 bytes you are tested, right? And then you would let it loose. And the moment you let it loose, you will find that you will be highly embarrassed because one of your customers has 10 to the power of 20 bytes and the whole system would crash because the query optimizer would saturate and fail at this point. This you could only discover at runtime. And then it's a big uh, difficulty to go and figure this out. But we were able to uh, find this out on a simple laptop because everything is fake. So we cheated the system to think it at 10 to the power of 20 bytes. It immediately broke down. We went backwards and did a simple binary search saying 10 to the power 19, 10 to the power 18, what's happening? And found this error. And when we told the, uh, the company, they looked at it and said, yeah, this guy has gone and written this value because in imagination 15 years back was that how could you ever reach 10 to the power of 20 bytes because that is unthinkable, right? So this is what actually happened. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a kind of a very high level flavor as to what is testing and why it is important and so on. Although most of you would have been conditioned by our seniors to say that this is the worst thing that could ever happen and so on. But actually research on automating big data testing is great technical fun. We have a couple of PhD students working on it, including one who is here in the front row, as you can see from his extremely sad face, uh, what is happening. <laughs> With Im the interesting thing is that this is a technically challenging problem, but it has immediate practical relevance because all the industry wants it, right? So what I would request you to do is stop protesting, instead be protesting. Right? One of the most important things to do. And if you're still interested in this and want to look at all those war stories, the software, if you want to download it and submit it as your VTech project or whatever, okay? All the publications are there here, okay? And you can have a look at it and then you'll see that underlying risk testing methodology, there's a lot of fun stuff to be done and hopefully that will change your perspective on this whole problem. And using such tools, now you can get big data to work. So at least I'll end on a positive note. Before this talk, you could not have gotten big data to work. But with COD, now you can. Okay, thank you. So the time to third question is that God can be God. God is God. <laughs>